Morning. Any questions? Do you what what material is covered? Yeah, like, where is like, where's the point? Oh, the cutoff point would be chapter uh, end of chapter three, I think. Uh, before we started the functional approximation, okay. so yeah. Newton's method would be included. Uh, Multi-dimensional Newton's method, the CSTR example that we saw, will be included. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is cumulative. So it will include everything from the beginning of the course uh, till Newton's method, multidimensional Newton's method. So model, basically, uh, you will have questions from chapter one on um, mathematical modeling, and classification, and uh, uh, so you can certainly expect one question on system of nonlinear algebraic equations. Um, and some on module value problem. That there won't be that section in the exam that deals with MATLAB coding. In the sense, what will MATLAB do if you enter this command? Uh, that won't be there. But there will be a problem, and possibly for some problems, a piece of code that claims to solve the problem with some errors and for you to fix those errors. That kind of a question. Okay, so there is no assignment this week till next Tuesday, and I will put up the next assignment uh, on Tuesday or Wednesday. I'll be back Tuesday night, so I should be able to put something there. So that is assignment number four. Assignment number five is with the TA, but the TA is also going to the same conference that I'm going. So he asked me whether he could have an extension to finish grading. And I'm coming back on Tuesday, but he's coming back only on Friday, I believe. So. Number five may not be available for you till the end of next week, um, but I have posted the solution to number five. So the solutions to all the assignments are on portal. And the current standing is also up to date with marks all the way up to assignment number four and the quizzes and the exams, the current ranking. So this just to give you feedback. Okay. <clears throat> so if there are no additional questions, uh, let's briefly review what we did in the last class. So we are talking about this general subject of functional approximation. How do you approximate functions or how do you approximate tabular data in the form of functions? So curve fitting is part of the exercise. And uh, we are blending both theoretical analysis of it, development, as well as uh, practical implementation using polyfit and polyval. So we started with that. So you should know what these functions do and how to use them. They basically do polynomial curve fitting of any degree given a data that is polyfit does the curve fitting and gives you the coefficients of the polynomial and polyval then uses the coefficients and evaluate the uh, function at any other value other than the, tab the tabular value. So it can be used for interpolation, extrapolation, etc. So we saw examples using steam table and I will continue to demonstrate a few uh, other uh, examples today. Uh, particularly, there is a very nice tool called uh, uh, C C CF tool, I think, curve fitting tool, uh, with, with a nice graphical user interface that allows you to import data, do the curve fitting, do analysis, etc., without writing a program. And then it will allow you to write the program uh, you know, by automatically. And we'll see the automatic code generation as well in the feature in MATLAB. And we talked about the idea of the least squares curve fitting. And that's an important one. What is the basis behind least squares curve fitting for polyfit, for example? Um, so essentially, find the errors at every data point between what is given as the data and what you would predict. And use these coefficients in the polynomials as your degree of freedom to tune those coefficient values in such a way that the error is minimized. And in fact, the square, the sum of the squares of the errors is minimized. So that is why it's called the least squares error, least squares curve fitting. Okay, and uh, we also saw as an aside how to transfer data between Excel and MATLAB using Excel Link, and we introduced the idea of a MuPad program within MATLAB for doing symbolic processing. So when we looked at error function as a function, we saw that uh, it is built in, and you can do operations with not only error function but number of other functions 
routine calculus type of uh, operations, taking derivatives, taking integrals, etc., analytically. Towards the end of the last lecture, we are looking at this idea of a basis function, how to represent a complicated function in terms of a linear combination of basis functions. And we said the basis functions could be as simple as the set 1, x, x squared, x cubed, etc. So if you take a finite number of terms, you can construct a finite degree polynomial using that. One of the key ideas in the basis function is all these functions must be linearly independent. What that means is you should not be able to express any of the basis functions as a linear combination of the others. For example, x squared, there is no way you can express it as a linear combination of 1 and x. So x squared is independent. So this idea is in, from the vector space, you must have a linearly independent basis vectors. No vector should be able to be represented like i1 cannot be represented in terms of i2. i1 and i2 are completely independent. i1 has the components 1, 0. i2 has the components 0, 1. When you extend that to third dimension, it will be 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, etc. So they are independent. So in the same sense, the basis set must form a linearly independent set. And then we can construct any arbitrary function as a combination of those. And we're going to continue with that idea of taking the error function and constructing an approximation for the error function. The error function graphically looks like this. It's nicely scaled between 0 and 1. The maximum value it can ever take is 1. And the domain is 0 to infinity. But it reaches 1 around a value of 2 or so. After that, it doesn't change. Okay, That's the nature of the error function. Now, the error function can be expanded in terms of a series. And that series is given here. It's an infinite series. And it comes basically from taking the exponential function infinite series, putting it in the error function definition. And remember, if you recall, the error function definition is simply uh, 2 over square root of pi, uh, 0 to x e to the power minus psi square d psi. So x is the argument. So the integral from 0 to x of that function e to the power minus psi square d psi is your error function. Okay? So we have an infinite series representation, but we cannot carry infinite calculations in any computer. Uh, so we truncate it. So introduce this idea of a truncation error. Okay, the error that is introduced by truncating the infinite series with a finite number of terms. These terms can be two or three or four, etc. The more accurate result you want, the more number of terms you need to take because every subsequent term is going to be smaller than the previous term. Then we say that the series is convergent. Okay, So we introduce an error. This is the analytical part, the analysis of it. We introduce an error as the difference between the actual function and the truncated function, truncated to a certain degree of polynomial, 2n plus 1. We take n terms, the degree of the polynomial will be 2n plus 1. And so that is the approximate function. P2n plus 1 is the approximation to the error function. We indicate that by the approximation sign. And the difference between this, the exact and the approximate, is your error. And the error obviously depends on where you evaluate the function and how many terms that you take. So we indicate that the error, error depends on the error in the error function, depends on the number of terms you take and the location where you want to evaluate that function. And we saw the table in the last class that showed that farther away you are from x, you need to take more terms. And uh, of course, taking more terms reduces the error for any given value of x. <coughs> so now we are going to, my goal in this section is to show you how does MATLAB do the curve fitting exercise? How does polyfit work? Okay. So in every algorithm that we see, we learn how does MATLAB do the job. F solve, we saw what are the algorithms, what are the ideas that go into F solve f0, etc. So this is now about polyfit and polyval. Okay, so polyfit essentially calculates these polynomial coefficients. So this is my coefficient that is unknown. And these are my basis functions, which are known. And my basis functions are simply, as I said, the set 1x, x squared, x cubed, x to the power 4, etc. Okay, so I'm representing them in a concise way as x to the power i minus 1, i going from 1, 2, 3, up to 
uh, n. Okay, so the polynomial then explicitly takes this form, and my job is to find what is the best value of a such that the error is minimized. Okay, that error is minimized. So in here, a is the unknown. Okay, I can calculate the function at those locations, or I can use tabulated data like in steam table. Okay, so this function that you see here either can come from evaluating the error function at fixed points or from a tabular data. And this is the polynomial approximation which has a as an unknown, a1, a2, a3 as an unknown, and I need to find what those are. That is a problem. Okay, and this problem can be converted into a problem of solving a set of linear algebraic equations. This is called linear curve fitting. Why is it called linear curve fitting? In what, what is the definition of linear versus nonlinear, or a simple way of looking at it? If you have an unknown, look for powers of the unknown, products of the unknown, then it makes it nonlinear. In this case, the unknowns are the coefficients a1, a2, a3, and they all appear in a linear fashion. So you have x to the power i does not make it nonlinear because x is known. The locations where we calculate the functions are known. Okay, So either you have a tabular data tabular data like x i f i okay 10 20 30 40 and at those points you may have say pressures 14 17 21 24 etc okay so either you have a tabular data which means the function is known and x i the location is known so these are known and so in this one the x is known and the f is known what is not known is the coefficients. We need to tune these coefficients, fit these coefficients in such a way that this error is minimized. Okay. Now that problem, as I said, can be converted into a system of linear algebraic equations, and that's what we're going to show as an example using a very specific example. Okay. The example is the following: find an approximation to the error function in the domain only 0.1 to 0.5. So I'm interested, even though the error function is defined from 0 to infinity, I'm instructed in, interested in constructing an approximation in the domain 0.1 to 0.5, x from 0.1 to 0.5. And I'm interested in constructing a cubic polynomial. Okay, so I tell you the basis set is 1 x x squared x cubed. And so my proposed function is a1 plus a2 x plus a3 x squared plus a4 x cubed. And the unknown coefficients are a1, a2, a3, a4. So I have four coefficients that I need to solve for in such a way that this function represents the best possible representation for the error function over the domain 0.1 to 0.5. Okay, this could be a simple problem in the final exam where I say this is the function, this is the representation, formulate the problem. Okay, and the formulate the problem means you need to make a system of four e equations for these four unknowns. We know the four unknowns are. We need to assemble a set of four equations to evaluate those. How do we do that? We can take the domain x from point 0.1 to point 0.5 and I take two additional points equally spaced. Okay, So I have four points. At these four points, I calculate my error function. Okay, I can calculate the error function because I know uh, there is a uh, function in MATLAB that will allow me to do, or if it is a steam table, I know what the pressures are at those four locations. So these four data points are known. And I have a function here, and that function can be, uh, can have many different representations. Oops, sorry. Okay, the function could be like this or the function could be like this by changing these constants a1, a2, a3, a4. So I want to do it in such a way that it exactly passes through those four data points. That means I want the error at these four data points to be exactly equal to zero. That's how I get my four degrees of freedom. That's an important idea. Okay, and the second idea that we will see is we have a fourth degree polynomial, but we have 400 data points then all I can do is I cannot make the fourth degree polynomial to go through all the 400 data points, but I can say minimize the error. 
that's the least squares idea. Okay, this is the exact curve fitting. And the other one is least squares curve fitting. Okay, so here I'm asking the curve to pass through exactly those four points. In between, you will have errors, but exactly at those four points, you should not should not have any errors. Any questions on that? No. Absolute silence. Okay, so let's continue that. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to, I said I'm going to select four equal points, but I'm going to present a more general solution, meaning it doesn't have to be fourth degree. I can tell you seventh degree or ninth degree, nth degree. So n, I'm going to ask you to select n data points that are equally spaced. So let me ask you, instead of me doing all the talking, what does that particular line do? Given a degree of the polynomial, given the number of data points, okay. So if I have a cubic, I have four. So n actually represents the number of uh, degrees of freedom, number of unknowns in the polynomial. So the degree of the polynomial will be one less than this. So if n is four, the degree of the polynomial will be three, but I will have four unknowns. So this xk is simply the points from the starting to the ending with equal number of intervals. Okay. So look carefully at that. When k is equal to 1, this is 0. So xk is, x1 is a. a is my left boundary. Okay? So the data points are given from a to b. x1 is equal to a. When k is equal to n, you have n minus 1, n minus 1. So that cancels out b minus a. a and a cancel out, so it gives you b. Okay? So my domain goes from a to b. So x goes from a to b. That domain is equally divided, and the number data points are numbered as x1, x2, x3, all the way up to xn. And this line simply calculates those data points where I'm given the independent variable. Okay, and the dependent variable, of course, is the function that is also given at those locations. Okay, and what I'm going to do is using that and using xk here, which are known. I'm going to set up a problem that will solve for the coefficients in the polynomial. So this is a line that's going to appear in my MATLAB code. So I want you to understand what that particular line does. It generates equally spaced data point. In MATLAB language, linspace does the same object. You give the left hand side, right hand side and say I want four points, it will generate that automatically for you. Okay, But it uses a simple one line code like this. Okay, so we want the error at these points. So we, we know where the points are on the x-axis. We want the error at these points to be equal to zero. Okay, that is the difference between the actual function value and what the polynomial predicts at those locations xk. I want that difference to be equal to zero. That is the condition. Okay, so I will have as many conditions because I can calculate them for k going from 1 to n. So I will get n equations. I will get n equations from making the error equal to zero at those n locations. Okay. And because they are equal to zero, the next line I'm simply rearranging. I'm moving this to the right hand side. The f of k, I'm moving that to the right hand side. So the polynomial, I'm replacing it by its representation, which is summation of ai x i uh, x k to the power i minus one is equal to f k. That makes the error at those locations equal to zero. Now what I want you to see is that this is not, this one the unknowns are a's and xk's are known, a function is known. Okay, So that is a system of n linear algebraic equations in the n unknowns a1, a2, a3. <coughs> so and that can be written in a matrix form. p times a equal to f, p will be a matrix n, n by n in size, a will be a vector of unknowns a1, a2, a n, and f will be the known function values f1, f2, fn. Okay, and then you use a matrix inversion operator in MATLAB to solve. Polyfit does exactly that. All the ideas that we have seen in these steps, polyfit does exactly that. Okay, it simply takes you from you the x values and the f values, assembles the matrix, inverts the matrix, and returns the coefficient a as a vector for you. Okay. 
but you should be able to do this by hand to show that you understand exactly what MATLAB does. Any questions on that? Let's take one step further and actually do it by hand. Okay, So this example does that. So here is the equation for the error. Here are the equally spaced points between point 1 and point 5. I want four points. Okay, So the two intermediate points are at point 233 and point 366. So that line tells me that from point 1 to point 5, there are two intermediate points at point 233 and point 366. At these points, I have on the y-axis the function. Okay, And those are these error function at x1, the error function at x2. The error function at x1 turns out to be 0.1125. The error function at x2 turns out to be 0.2586. Those are the right-hand side of your 4 by 4 equation. Okay, You'll have 4 equations in 4 unknowns. And that is your right-hand side of the error function at those four. So this is equation 1 at point 1, equation 2 at point 2, point 3, point 4, etc. It's the same equation. A1 plus A2x plus A3x squared plus A4x cubed. But this is evaluated at x1. So x1 is known. Remember that. x1 is what? x1 is point 1. So this is point 1. This is point 1 squared. This is point zero 0.01. This is point 1 cubed, point zero zero 0.001. But what is the unknown? The unknown is a1, a2, a3, a4. I'm missing an a4 there. Include that. a4. Any questions on that particular example? This you should be able to do by hand, okay, on any problem, in a curve fitting problem. Okay? The right hand side is the table of data or the function, known function evaluated at known points. The left hand side is that function that you are going to fit with the unknown coefficients a1, a2, a3, a4. They appear linearly. So this is called a linear curve fitting. You know, the polynomial is not a linear function. The curve fitting problem is a linear problem because the coefficients are uh, linear. So then at point 2, which is at point 233, plug in those point 233, 233 squared, 233 cube, etc. Then at the third point, it's point 366. 366 squared, 366 cubed. And the fourth point is 0 0.5, 0 0.5 squared, 0.5 cubed. Yeah? Please, yeah, I, I want you to ask those questions because that, that, that's important. That's how I know whether I'm getting to you or not. Your question is, is the answer to that function known? The unknowns are the coefficients a1, a2, a3. And let, let me rephrase that problem to make sure that um, the problem is clear. Okay, So I have a set of data points on the x-axis. This is the same thing what I said as xi, fi. Okay? Uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.233, 0 0.366, 0 0.5. And at those functions, I'm given what are the function values at those locations. And those function values turn out to be in this case 0 0.1125, 0 0.2586, 0.3959 and 0.5205. This is just an example of an error function. So the, this is the value of the error function at these locations of x. Okay, But a different problem could be steam table. So the x could be temperature and y could be pressures. You look it up and you know what those values are. And your task is to construct a function that passes through this set of data points. An approximate function that passes through this set of data points. So the f goes on the right hand side. So these are known. Okay, the right hand side has either from a table or from a function known values of the function that you want to approximate. The left hand side is the actual approximation that you're trying to build. And that approximation will have coefficients in them. And those coefficients are the unknowns. Okay, is that clear? Mm -hmm. Okay, to everybody. Now we have written down explicitly four equations in four unknowns. Our job now is to assemble the matrix. Okay, so how do I assemble the matrix? This is going to be because I'm squeezed for space. I'll I'll have four by four. Okay, on the right hand side I will have point one. 
1, 2, 5 in the first equation. Let me focus on the first equation. On the, on, and the vector of unknown is going to be a1, a2, a3, a4. You should be able to generalize this for a fifth degree or sixth degree polynomial. Okay? And so you tell me what will be the numbers that go on the first row? 1, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001. So when you take the product of 1 times a1, 0 0.1 times a2, 0 0.01 times a3 and add them up, you're going to get the first equation equal to 0.1 multiplied. You have done this before for the pipeline problem, etc. Okay? Write down the equations and then put them in a matrix form and then solve it. Once you understand it, you should be able to represent it in a piece of a code in MATLAB. I will show you the MATLAB code that does that. Okay? So for the second one, for example, it will be 1 and then 0 0.233, 0 0.233 square, 0 0.233 cube, and the right hand side will be 0 0.2586. You get the idea, right? You can finish the remaining part of the matrix. And all you need to do is now, this is in the form PA is equal to F. So A is equal to P backslash F. We'll give you the coefficients of the polynomial. Okay. And this idea is what is generally expressed in this equation. Okay. So P A equals F is your linear system of any degree, any size N, and the size of the matrix is determined by the number of data points that you pick. The degree of the polynomial is one lower than the number of data points that you have. Okay, And uh, so that is a linear curve. Polyfit does exactly that. Okay, uh, For those cases where you have the degree of the polynomial matching the number of data points exactly, then we can say at those data points I want the error to be zero. Polyfit does something more. It does this, but it does something more. What more does it do? When you have, as I said, four data points, uh, sorry, fourth degree, uh, third degree polynomial, four unknowns, but 40 data points or 400 data points. Then it cannot make the polynomial to go through every one of those data points. You cannot make the error equal to zero. So it just minimizes the error between all the 400 data points and your fourth degree polynomial. And that's what we are going to see next, the idea behind that. Um, any questions? Let me open up uh, the MATLAB function that does um, <coughs> I should have fired this up before. <coughs> Okay, so this is a small function that I have written that will implement this particular problem. So I named the function as erf underscore approx. It's an approximate error function. n is my input, so I've generalized it. I can fit second degree, third degree, fourth degree, fifth degree, any degree polynomial to that. Okay, and what this function will return is the coefficients a. Okay, and I have some <laughs> comments or help. And then I set up my domain. My domain is given to be 0.1 to 0.5. Okay? And you remember this line. This line essentially picks what are called collocation points, the points where I want to evaluate the function. This is exactly the same equation that I showed you earlier. Okay? And here I'm calculating the actual values of the right hand side, the error function, at those collocation points, at those four points or five points. Okay? And here is just one loop that sets the matrix up for me. The 4x4 four four matrix that we wrote is actually implemented in a more general way in a loop. So each time it goes through the loop, what do you think it will do? Can you decipher that piece of code? Who can decipher that? Okay, let's do it part by part, take it apart, okay? So on the left hand side, I have PK comma colon. So when K equal to one, I am assembling the 
first row because I have a colon that means everything, all the columns, but k is one, first row. So I'm assembling the first row of the matrix P. Okay, and what does that matrix contain? It contains one x, x square, x cube, x to the power four, etc. Okay, for any degree of the polynomial. So I need to know. So this square, what is whatever is in the square brackets, zero colon n minus one. Remember, one is the same as x to the power zero. And two, the second position is x to the power one. So this, what I have highlighted here, contains the exponents. And this is xk. When k equal to one, I'm taking the first number x1, my first allocation point, and dot exponent. So element by element, I'm constructing the exponent of that. So x to the power zero, x to the power one, x to the power two, etc. And that is the first row which is put into that matrix. When k equal to two, I'm filling the second row of the matrix. Using the second data. So it's really not difficult to translate that into a code if you understand what that equation does. Okay, so this is essentially constructing it, and then I print the matrix and pr pr print the determinant of the matrix, and here is my actual solution A equals P backslash F. If you look at the code for polyfit, it will have all the elements of this. Of course, as I said, it is more complicated because it also does least square square fit. This is exact curve fit passing through the data points. Okay, so to run this one, all I need to do is erf a p p r x four. So the determinant of the matrix is fairly small. Okay, this is one of the problems with regular curve fitting. If you increase the number of data points you will find that the determinant keeps going down even more. But these, I claim, are the coefficients of the polynomial curve for the third degree. So I'm saying that if I get from polyfit, of course, I need to generate the data points, the functions. So let me say x is equal to um, 0. Um, let me just copy that code instead of typing it. Okay. I want to copy this code. I, I want to define A and B and then generate X. I'm just being lazy here. Uh, N is equal to 4 and then let me run that. Okay, so I have defined X equally spaced data points and F is going to be the error function of X. Okay, so I have X and I have F. If I call polyfit, what I'm claiming is it should give me the same result that I showed you for A. Oh, I guess I read in the A. Um, that's okay. Let me do polyfit first. C equals polyfit x comma f. Okay, x is the independent variable, equally spaced data. F is the error function values of those locations. And polyfit takes that and I say fit a third degree polynomial in polyfit. It returns these four coefficients, okay? And these four coefficients should be the same as the one that I got from this. And I want you to explain if you find any difference, what the difference is, okay? Let me recap. So this is coming from the function that I wrote, which I interpreted at a function, and the coefficients A are doing like this. And that, those are the coefficients I get from polyfit. What is the difference? They're backwards. Why do you think they're backwards? I define my polynomial as 1, a1 plus a2x plus a3x squared plus a4x cubed. Maybe polyfit did it the other way. Okay, let's ask for help on polyfit. You can see p1 x to the power n. So the highest degree is as the first coefficient. Okay, so I should have paid attention and did it the same way as they did, but they essentially give you the same result except they are reversed because the way that I define my polynomial is different from the way that MATLAB defined it. But the numbers are the same. Okay, so it is the same cubic polynomial the polyfit does that we did uh, using that. Uh, assembling that linear matrix. And that's what I wanted to show you. How, how does polyfit work? Any questions on that? So here I have 
using a fifth degree polynomial, and this I'm giving you as a kind of an exercise. You should do something like this and be prepared for the final exam. So this is the error function. The actual error function is in blue. Okay, And I generated five data points instead of four data points to fit a quartic polynomial. A quartic is a fourth degree polynomial. Okay, So it will have five unknowns. So I generated five data points and fit it over the same range from 0 to 0.5. And I plotted that polynomial. And that polynomial is this one fourth degree polynomial as an approximation to the error function over that domain 0 to 0.5. And you see that it does very well, it fits very well, it agrees very well with the actual error function. The difference is not significant. So if, if I evaluate this error polynomial at any intermediate points, I'll be interpolating and getting very accurate values. But if I evaluate using that polynomial error function at 2.5, I will be predicting this. And the actual error function is 1. Then I will be extrapolating it. So once again, I am showing the dangers of extrapolation. You should not extrapolate your data much beyond the range over which you have fitted. If you have fitted from 0 to 0.5, it's okay to use between, between 0 and 0.5, maybe 0 0.6, 0 0.7, etc. But don't go beyond that. Then you'll be extrapolating, and the polynomial can do completely different behavior than the actual function. But you should be able to construct this polynomial, I mean this matrix, for the fourth degree polynomial and verify it. I've just given you the answer and I've given you the coefficients. And I will put up the function so that you can also run and learn from the function. But you should be comfortable, everyone should be comfortable in being able to assemble that problem. Any questions on that? How many of you feel you need more help? Maybe I'll put, it, uh, put an exercise problem in the next assignment if you do need. Any questions? No? Okay, so the next idea is the least squares idea. Okay, that is if I have more data points than the degree of the polynomial. I have 200 data points and I have a fourth degree polynomial. How do I minimize? So graphically, the, the problem is the following. Okay, I have a lot of data points that comes from experiment. And I want to put a function that's say a cube, cubic polynomial. Okay, then at every point I will have error. The error will be the difference between where the actual data point is and what the function predicts. So that function is supposed to be the approximate representation of all the data. Particularly if the data comes from experiments, you can have scatter. You can have random errors in there. You can noise. So you want to filter those noise. So this is actually used, least squares can be used to smooth the function as well. Okay, Instead of saying this function is actually something like this, making it pass through every data point that you have, you say the function is going to be actually a smooth function. Okay, So you pick deliberately a low degree polynomial, but you have a lot of data points. So the key here we're saying is that n is less than m. The degree of the polynomial n that you choose is less than the number of data points that is represented in M. Okay, And once again, we construct an error at every one of those data points xk. So the table of xk, the function k are given to you with lots of data. And at every one of those, you evaluate the low degree polynomial, take the difference, and that is your error. In least squares method, you take that error and square it and sum all the errors, because you'll have a lot of data points. So sum all the errors, and divide it by the number of data points. That gives you the error per data point. Treat that as your goal or the objective function. Now, now we're going to do an optimization. Okay, And this idea is from calculus. When does a function have a minimum or a maximum? When the derivative is 0. right? So what we're going to do is we're going to plot oops, We are going to plot this j, what I call the objective function, that is the error, sum of squares of error, against a. a is the parameters in the polynomial that I'm going to tune. And this will have a behavior like this. Why will it have a behavior like that? Because it's a quadratic. I'm squaring the errors. Okay. So I want to find the best value of that set a, where the error is minimal 
the error cannot be 0 because I have too many data points and functions, right? So, the, the degree of the polynomial. So, I want to find that minimum. So, I need to set dj with respect to dA as equal to 0. Now, j is a scalar function, just one function, but it is a function of many variables because I have a1, a2, a3, a4, etc. Okay? So, I need to take the derivative of that function with respect to each one of those variables, the unknowns, okay, and set them as equal to 0. And that idea is what I am representing there. Coming straight, straight from calculus, I have to define what the error is, square the error sum the error, and define what the objective function is, and minimizing the objective function, that means I take the derivative of that function with respect to a1, then with respect to a2, then with respect to a3. Each one will give me one equation. So in my polynomial, I have n unknowns. Okay, the n unknowns, and I will. This is the mechanism by which I will assemble n equations. Previously, I said the error equal to zero. Here, I'm setting the error as minimum, and I'm obtaining n equations by uh, taking the derivative of that function with respect to each one of those variables. The next two lines are going to be pretty complicated. Okay, so you need to sit down in your dorm and make sure that you understand every one of those steps. This is the details of how I take the derivative. I will show you conceptually how it is done, but you need to, unless you do it by yourself, you will not be able to follow exactly. Okay? So let's try to go through the steps in, uh, carefully in sequence. Okay? So this is the error. The error is the difference between what the polynomial predicts, which is this part, and the actual function. That difference is my error. So I have squared the error, I have summed it up over all data points. So k goes from 1 to m, m is the number of data points, okay? And I'm going to take the derivative of that function. So here I'm substituting for the polynomial. So a second summation appears. The first summation represents the number of data points that I have. So it goes from 1 to m. So the upper limit for this will be m. Okay, and inside that function, I said I'm taking. Uh, maybe let me try this. Okay, replacing it with the polynomial expansion. P is a symbolic representation of the polynomial, but the actual polynomial is represented as summation of a i x to the power i minus one. <coughs> okay, so there is a second summation which goes from one to n because the degree of the polynomial is n minus one. Okay. And then the square is, of course, there. So when I take the derivative, when I take the derivative of this entire expression with respect to a, remember, xk are all known data points, fk are all known data points again on the y-axis, x on the x-axis, f on the y-axis. So the unknowns are a. So I need to take the derivative with respect to a. So I'm using the chain rule. Okay. So the, when I take the derivative of this entire thing, something square, it must be twice that. That's why I get this twice that entire function that you see here and then multiplied by the derivative inside of this particular part with respect to a1 okay of course derivative of a1 with respect to a1 would be what one okay and that's why i get only x k to the power j minus one and that is equal to zero so i'm taking the derivative and setting that equal to zero so there are two summation terms the two comes from the fact that i'm taking the derivative of a square term and then this one comes from the fact of the chain rule with respect to A. So the unknowns here are the AIs. And then you move this to the right hand side, the F times XK to the power J minus 1. And you get again a system of linear algebraic equations. So the linear because A's all appear by themselves, not as a product or anything like that. Okay, But XK's are all known and these are all known. And when you expand that and write it in a matrix form, I'm not going to go through this in detail because you need to work through this. If you have difficulty, if you don't understand, come and see me. When you expand this in a matrix form, this is the matrix that you will get. And this matrix has very nice properties. The first thing that you will notice is that it's symmetric. x k to the power n minus 1, x k to the power n minus 1. So symmetric matrices have nice properties. So it's not like the previous case, the determinant was going to 0. It becomes a what is called an ill posed problem as the degree of the polynomial goes up. In this case, you will have a nice well posed problem that you can invert. Once again, it's a linear system, you can invert and 
all the elements of this you should be able to calculate and all this you should be able to calculate as well on the right hand side because these contain only the given data points from the table okay so this is really for those who want an A, you should be able to work through this. And there may be a question that kind of tries to distinguish those guys who want to go deeper. So it's a, the idea behind least squares is fairly easy to grasp, but the mathematics is not difficult to grasp, but you need to be determined to be able to understand how to assemble this matrix. And Polyfit exactly does that. Any questions? I would strongly encourage you to go through that four lines on that page and if you don't understand come and see me and I will try to explain it in greater detail okay <clears throat> now that's the theoretical underpinning of curve fitting uh, at least one aspect of curve fitting the polynomial curve fitting okay so you should be able to understand when a curve fitting problem becomes linear and when it is nonlinear I'm going to show you an example of when it becomes nonlinear as well. And there is a very powerful tool that, which is actually a superset or a graphical user interface for any curve fitting, not just polynomial curve fitting. And that is called CF tool in MATLAB. So I'm going to illustrate how that works using the steam table. Okay. <coughs> so this is the practical part. This you should find extremely useful. Uh, throughout your chemical engineering career in the science of and there you have a curve fitting problem it's a beautiful tool for you to use because it's very simple okay <coughs> well, what we're going to do is first um, I'm going to fit the steam table data to not a polynomial approximation which we saw in the last class but to a nonlinear functional approximation okay <coughs> and that function is <coughs> given by this equation that you see here. Okay, So this is log p equals a minus b divided by t over c. Okay, Log to the base 10 of p equals a minus b divided by t minus c. So in this function, a, b, and c are the parameters, like the coefficients in the polynomial. But this is not a polynomial. Okay, This is a nonlinear function. <coughs> and a, b, c appear in a nonlinear fashion because you have a division here. Okay, so this is a nonlinear curve fitting, but this is the functional form that best represents vapor pressure data. How do we know that? We know that from thermodynamic models. Okay, so you will learn in a thermodynamic course why vapor pressures are always fitted in this form of an expression. And in the table that I showed you in the last class, uh, the coefficients of a, b, and c are given. These are taken from the Wikipedia steam table. So let me open that up. <coughs> okay, so if you go to Wikipedia, you will find the pressure versus temperature data, experimentally measured data, and the form of the equation. This is where I took this from, A minus B divided by T, A minus B over T minus C. And these are the best values of A, B, and C and what they have done is they have broken the domain in the temperature, the independent variable, into two, from 273 to 333 and 333 to 423. Why do you think they would have done that? Pardon me? These are the data points in which I have data. For example, 0 degree C is 273 degrees Kelvin. So starting from 273, they went up to 333. Okay, and then split it into two sets. My question is, why do they do it? Can we not, can we get away without doing it? Can we get away using the entire data set? And the answer is yes. But if you want more accuracy, then you would want to fit the polynomial or this particular function over smaller data sets. Okay? And th they have chosen to break it into two. But we will see that we don't need to do that. Okay? We can fit the entire data using the same functional form. Okay? I'm going to use this functional form. It's log to the base 10. Uh, on the y-axis for the pressure and on the x-axis temperature and a, b and c are the unknowns I want to find using MATLAB using least square curve fitting idea. Okay, that's the goal. So let's go to MATLAB and import that data. Oh, I guess I need to start Excel. So 
whenever I start Excel, I'm set it up in such a way that it will also start a MATLAB session. So I probably have two MATLAB sessions now. <laughs> I'm trying to open the steam table that I had from last class uh, there. Okay, so here is the data, okay, and we already know how to export this data into um, Okay, let me take up to 210. Okay, so add in, put the matrix I define it as A. So in my workspace, I should have, I guess let me close this. This is the wrong MATLAB session. I have A. Okay. You can see that A is there. So I'm going to split this into two vectors, T and P. So T is the first column. And P is the second column. Okay, and I want log 10 of P. So I'm going to call it as YP equals log 10 of P. Okay, on the Y axis, I want logarithm to the base 10 of the vapor pressure. So YP is my independent variable. Okay, please, if I'm going fast, stop me and ask questions. Okay. What I'm trying to do is do that curve fitting for the nonlinear one using CF tool. CF tool is a graphical user interface for curve fitting problems in general. I start that. And it's organized very nicely. Okay, the first step that you will do is import the data. The second step is do the data fitting. And then you can do the plotting and analysis. So let's import the data. So when you select data, it says, okay, what is your X data? And it shows the data that are available in the workspace. It is PT, but I want the X data to be temperature. And what do I want the Y data to be? YP, because it is the log of the vapor pressure. Okay, So that is how the data looks. On the Y axis, I have logarithm of the vapor pressure to the base 10. On the X axis, I have temperature. So I create the data set. I give it a name. So you can have multiple data sets to compare, for example. Okay, So here I have the data set that I have created. And if you want to view that, there it shows you. This is the temperature on the x-axis and on the y-axis y logarithm of the pressure, vapor pressure to the base 10. Okay, And this is the graphical way that the, uh, the data looks. And I want to fit a function through that. So the next thing I do is select the fitting. Okay, So it's a new fit. and the data set is this. So as I said, you can have multiple data sets. Then it will give you as many data sets as you have. You can pull whatever you want. And here I pick the type of the fit. So here is a polynomial fit. Suppose I pick the linear polynomial fit and say apply. Okay. So I'm fitting a linear. That doesn't look very good. Right. So I go back to the fitting and I say I want uh, quadratic. Okay, better. But what I really still, still you can see that the errors here are large, and if you look at actually the data, it will give you the root mean square of the errors. Okay, there is something called R square. R square is a normalized indicator of how good the fit is. That should be close to one. So it is already 0 0.9991, which is a reasonably good fit. And RMSC stands for root mean square error. Error between what that equation predicts and what the actual data is. That is 0 0.03. Ideally, you would like that to be as small as possible. So if you keep increasing the degree of the polynomial, you will notice that it keeps going down. It's now 0 0.01. From 0 0.03, it has come down to 0 0.01. These are all linear curves. What it does is it calls polyfit and generates the coefficients, does some statistical analysis on the error, and provides those errors in this window for you with the R square, sum of square errors, etc. Okay. Um, now, I said we want to fit that particular function, and that's not a polynomial. So then what I need to do is pull down, and it gives you a lot of additional functions that are built in. 
with the Fourier we talked about, for example, for exponential. But you can have a custom equation. You can put your own equation. This you will find extremely helpful when you're doing a lab, you're taking data and you want to do a curve fitting, okay? And you have an equation that you want to fit. So you can define what that equation should be. So pick custom equations and define the new equation, okay? So here you have a linear equation and general equation. So pick the general equation as your formula and then write the expression. The independent variable in my case is t and the dependent variable, the equation is going to be, uh, what was that equation? I forget. Bear with me. Uh, it's a minus b over t minus c, okay. Uh, what is that equation? Okay, here. A minus B divided by T minus C. That's all you need to do. So, pardon? Yeah, thank you. You are very alert. Good. <laughs> really glad. Okay, so T is an independent variable and I have picked the dependent variable also, yp, which is a logarithm. So I have assembled my data points and I want that data to be fitted to this form of the equation. So I am asking now, find me the best value of a, b and c such that the data and the equation fit as closely as possible. Okay. So you can put any equation you want. That's where the real power is. And this is a nonlinear curve fitting. So say OK and apply. So it's computing the fit. And where is the graph? I did something terrible. <laughs> the, the fitted graph is the red line and the data point is this. So what mistake did I make? Let's see. The data, oh, I guess I don't have the data point selected. No, I did. Okay, what else did I do? Yes, it is yp versus t. That's right. Yp equals that, not y. In the equation? Yeah, uh, not I don't think that should matter because that's just a dependent variable name. Uh, ah. Let me go back to the web page and show you. The problem is in units. Can anybody spot what the error is? The pressure is in kilopascals. These pressures are in kilopascals. That's fine. But the temperature is in Kelvin. These are in Celsius. So what happens when they evaluate log of zero? <coughs> minus infinity. And that's why this has a singularity or the graph looks weird at that point. So what I should do to fix that is go back to this and yeah, go back to the MATLAB session and define t as equal to t plus 273. Now t is in degree Kelvin. Okay. And now if I go and ask it to redo the fit, it should be fine. Yeah, I think that's okay. So, fit options. Where is, why is this not enabled now? There's some other problem. Pardon me? Where do you see the table options? This is the fit. Maybe it did the fit already? No. You can delete that. T, Y, P. Okay, that's fine. Then fitting. T, 
custom equations. Click OK, it changes the BO. Click OK. Okay, let me delete the flat and then redo again. I'm not sure what the problem is. So, two custom supply, yeah. The graph hasn't changed yet. It's going to no, I don't want to do that. Okay, let me see. View the data to make sure that. Yeah, the data has been imported. Okay, now I understand the problem. The data was imported, and then I went and increased the temperature by 273. I need to re import the data. Doesn't automatically do that. Okay. Um, so clear this data set and import t, import yp, create data set, to delete these. Okay, so here is the data set, and now these are in degrees Kelvin. Okay, so this should work. And then go to fitting, and a new fit, custom, there it is, there. The root mean square error is now 0 0.0073. Okay, and the fit you can see is pretty good. Let's just move that away. Okay, so my apologies for a little bit of an uh, error there, but it is a powerful tool in terms of fitting any function to a given data set. The power is even more. Okay, the next thing what we are going to do is we are going to ask MATLAB. To write a program that does all the things that we have done so far, okay, taking the data, adding the, uh, importing the data, doing a curve for defining the equation. So we are going to ask it to generate the code. Okay, so if you go to file, say generate code, it creates a function for you called create fit, which takes t as the input, yp as the input also, and it keeps track of everything that you have done. Okay, the functional form, and it gives you the output of the coefficients, okay, but on a different data set. So now you can use this not only for steam data, but you can import, for example, benzene vapor pressure as a function of temperature, and use this function to represent that data by an equation set, okay. So the function looks pretty complicated. Even I don't understand some parts of it, but it does everything that we have done in an automated way. Okay, but the important thing that we need to notice here is, does this function have any output? It takes two input that I can recognize because I defined them. T as a temperature and Yp is the logarithm of the vapor pressure. Okay, but it doesn't produce any output. What kind of output would I want from uh, a comforting exercise like this? Those are these coefficients a, b, and c right in that equation so a turns out to be 7.143 b turns out to be 1710 c turns out to be 40.47 this is for the whole data set from 0 to 200 degrees or so if you compare these coefficients with what they had in the website they will be different because they did it over two range but approximately the same ballpark instead of 7.23 that they have we got uh, 7.14, okay, but ours represents a much broader range of data set, okay. Um, <clears throat> let me go back to that function and let, let's explore that function, okay. So it takes two inputs, it produces no output, but the output that I want from a curve fitting exercises are those three coefficients, okay. Another way to look at this curve fitting problem is instead of storing those 40 data points, I store only three numbers, three coefficients. I have the ability to predict the vapor pressure at any temperature. This is what packages like Hysis and Aspen do. They take these data points, fit curves, and put them in the data bank. So when you pick, for example, Peng Robinson equation of state, it has a set of coefficients uh, appearing in that equation of state. If you pick Antoine equation, it will have a set of coefficients that appear in there that are stored, fitted through an exercise like this. Okay. 
So we want those coefficients. So the person who finds me those th coefficients where they are computed, I think should deserve an A. Where do you think it is stored? As I scan through it. You can see T, Y, P, okay, those are extracted from the array. And these are just plotting lines, plotting curves. There will be a line where it says fit. So there is a lot of comments here. It says fit this model using the new data. Okay. So if you have a new data of P and YP that's coming in for benzene, not for uh, steam, you use those data, call a function called fit, which is going to call maybe uh, another function called polyval or polyfit. But this is the output. So this is the one that gives you the three coefficients. Okay. So this is a guess. Okay, so let's ju just try that out and Put that, oh, I forget already what was that, C, CF underscore as the output, okay? So CF underscore equals. And then I save this. And I save it as CF, okay? So now I have a function that was entirely written by MATLAB for me, which will do curve fitting for vapor pressure data of any component as long as I have them in the right units. T is in degree Kelvin, YP is logarithm of the vapor pressure in kilopascals. And it will give me these three coefficients. Okay. So how do I use it? Well, I can go back to my, I can close this curve fitting part. Oh, let me close this. And I'm back in my MATLAB session and that function exists. Uh, it doesn't. <laughs> it's in this directory. Okay. ls star dot m simply lists all the functions. So there is a function called create fit dot m. So if I say create fit t comma yp, I'm now taking the same data for steam vapor pressure. Okay. It's, it, it is in my workspace. When I pass that, What is the error? <laughs> exactly, thank you. <laughs> okay, so now I can, I'm able to use any data set, I'm still using the steam data set to do the curve fitting, and I get as an output those three coefficients, a, b, and c, because they were stored in that variable cf underscore. Okay, now let me pose the task of how would I do it for benzene? Okay. So the first thing is I need to find the data for benzene. Where do I find the data for benzene? I go to the web page and there is a place called NIST web book. Okay. This is an excellent source for chemical database. Okay. The National Institute of Standards and Testing, they have data or all the chemicals that you can think of. Okay. So you can search for example and say I want um, C6H6, benzene. Oops. Today my fingers are not cooperating. <laughs> so it gives you everything you, that you need to know about benzene. Okay, what is its molecular formula? What is its molecular structure? Um, let me pick some other thing then. Uh, I cannot find benzene. XA. Okay, saturation properties, you see here. Okay. And in temperature increments. So I have picked a different component, hexane of uh, vapor pressure data. And it immediately tells me that range over which I can get the data is from 177 to 500. So let me pick 200 to 300 in increments of 10. Okay. It gives me okay table there. Temperature versus pressure from two hundred to three hundred. Okay, so I can do X Y plot.
I need to be able to export this data. <laughs> There it is. Okay. So here is the temperature, pressure, but it also gives me a lot of other data. Okay. Density, the molar volume, internal energy, etc. So let me select all these, copy that, control C, and then go to Excel. And create a new sheet and then paste it there. Control V. Oops. Do you know what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to take that data, put it into Excel, and then export it into MATLAB, and then do the curve fitting. Control C. Okay, let's save it into a text file. So, in Notepad. Ah, <laughs> thank you. So that's only what I'm missing at home. Oh. Yeah, I missed the two there. All right. Um, so let me see whether I can import that. Um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just going to do that. Um, this is a lot of waste of time, my apologies. I should have prepared this table ahead of time. Okay. okay. Same dot that. Okay. I hope it works. Okay. There you have finally. <laughs> okay. Now, a lot of steps to extract the data from the web. Really, what we did is quite remarkable because you have access to enormous amount of data that you can take and do analysis and do fitting on that. So we have been able to import it into Excel. Now you send it to MATLAB. Uh, Hexane, for example. Okay, so this data should go to MATLAB. And in MATLAB, you have this variable hexane. Okay, now you can extract the data. So, for example, T hexane equals hexane, a colon, comma, one. Oops. Uh, colon, comma, one. I will add the 273 to this already. Okay, and p hexane is equal to log 10 of hexane colon comma 2. Okay, so I have prepared the data, I've downloaded the data, I've prepared the data. Now all I have to do is create fit uh, t hexane and p hexane. There it is. Okay. And you get the new coefficients for this particular component in the workspace there. These are the Antoine coefficients for hexane vapor pressure data over that range. Okay. So the, the most important thing from all this exercise is that you can let MATLAB write the code for you. And this is actually a more general feature than what I have indicated here. Okay. This does it for curve fitting exercise. Okay. It captures everything that we have done using a graphical user interface. For every action that we did, it writes a corresponding code. And then you can use that code for other data processing. And this is a feature available even from your workspace. If you look at generate code, it's always available to you. So if you're doing from your workspace, generating the data, generating the plot, and then you want to generate the code for everything that you have done, by hitting this, it'll write the code. And then you can edit and create new functions like that. Okay, so a very powerful tool uh, within within MATLAB. 
So to recap then, the CF tool is a powerful tool that does not only polynomial curve fitting, but more general nonlinear curve fitting for any functional form. And uh, the graphical user interface makes it easy for you, but the underlying theory is very powerful. It's least squares curve fitting, okay? Minimizes the sum of the square errors. And if you identify any particular functional form that you have, it does automatically use the nonlinear curve fitting, nonlinear non minimization to give you the best set of coefficients in that expression, okay? That's a very powerful tool to the set of tools that we have seen already, FSOL and ODE45 and uh, BVP4C, CF tool is a uh, extremely powerful tool. Now this is a toolbox, so it may not be available in all the labs that you're going to use, particularly in the library, okay? But it is available in the engineering complex. In this building, all the labs should have CF tool available, including our chemical engineering building. Any questions? Okay, so, Let me go back to the notes and uh, see where we are. That's for CF2. Yeah, the next topic that we are going to talk about is called difference operators. Okay, so maybe this is a good place to stop. And next Tuesday, you have the exam, and Thursday, we will continue from this point on. I have put a past last year's midterm exam as a sample on Moodle. Yeah. Do you want the solutions too? <laughs> Would that help? <laughs> All right, I will do that today.